Welcome to this fireside chat. We're going to be talking about values and growth within the Web3 DeFi ecosystems. Uh, do we want to do a round of introductions? We got Kevin. You want to start? Hey, I'm Kevin Iwaki. I'm mostly known for founding Gitcoin. What's up? Uh, I'm Pat McGowan. I'm a co-founder at Number Group, which is a venture studio where Zach and I work together. And hey, I'm Alex Pruden. I'm the executive director of the Alio Foundation, uh, which is um, Foundation for Alio, which is a privacy preserving layer one. All right, yeah. Thank you guys for joining us today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is Zach Cole. I am an amateur economist. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank, thank you for joining us. So we're just going to kick it off. I think kind of what we're talking about is like, how can a project scale without losing its values, without selling out? So some of the topics we're probably going to discuss are token distributions and uh, how these systems work and how we can scale them effectively without kind of like selling our souls, quote unquote. So we might talk about fair launches and we'll kind of talk about the experiences that we've had in the space so far. Um, I guess we could start out by saying, uh, Let's define values first. What do you guys think? Let's just let's just dive in. What what, what are like the values that we that we hold to be true within this space? What does consensus dictate? Uh, well, I mean, I think the the stated values in the Ethereum white paper are around uh, censorship resistance, transparency, immutability, cor corruption resistance, and then I, I think there's also this. Uh, this thing that Ethereum does, which allows you to program your values into your own money, so you can express through turn complete smart contracts your own sets of values. And uh, that's a really interesting design space. And uh, yeah, so far we've used it to, to build a lot of Ponzi schemes. <laughs> so we value money, I think. Yeah, I feel like the battle is kind of decentralization versus people with money that don't give a shit about decentralization. They just see the opportunity. So. That's going to keep happening as the space grows. There's going to be more people from the outside that see lots of exciting things, and they just want to get a taste of that. And they might not have any understanding of decentralization or the purpose of it. So to me, I think it's about freedom and permissionless applications. Uh, yeah, I think, so I'm going to take the question slightly differently, because I think many people come to the space for different reasons and have different values. And I think, to me, that's one of the most special things about this space is I mean, just the diversity of people that participate in it is, is amazing. I think we're all united mostly by the values that Kevin talked about, specifically people who've been in the space for a while, because those values uh, themselves came from a lot of people in the Bitcoin community. Um, you know, obviously Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency. But I think the thing that I would say on the values piece is um, maybe just through the lens of what, what I define as integrity, which is that there's stated values and then there's lived values, right? And so I think... To me, an important thing that I try and emphasize or give people feedback on, sometimes publicly and through you know, commentary, is when the stated values, say in the case of decentralization, don't match the actions, right? Because I think those, the consistency between stated values and actions, I think, are a very important input in how people perceive us collectively as an industry. And unfortunately, I think it happens too often that there are people who see the opportunity to associate with the stated values, but act in a way that's contrary to them. And unfortunately, that reflects not only on them, but on all of us. So that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the themes I kind of pick up from you guys is like, oh, we have these values that we hold dear, and a lot of opportunists come into the space to take advantage of those for financial gain. But what do you think that to some, some extent, uh, that's by design? And we kind of need to consider game theory within our tokenomics and like our, uh, our mechanism design. I mean, don't we want to kind of take advantage of the inherent greed that people present and use that to our advantage? Isn't that kind of what regen is about? Kevin? Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think that, you know, what's, what's ethical is not always what's legal, is not always what's effective and the the kind of like ikigai, the alignment of those things is is what you can hold is is your north star, and um, you know I consider regen to sort of be like okay we have programmable money what if we could build 
pro-social, protopian, crypto-economic ecosystems, and a lot of the regen space for me was about defining a space for like more lefty type of culture, and um, and I think that there's a lot of opportunities uh, opportunities within that. But but uh, yeah, in the meantime, I, I think the crypto space is just weighed down by all these scams and Ponzi schemes. It just makes everyone else look bad optically. Would it make us look less bad if we leveraged all of that stuff for something like Gitcoin, for example? Like if a portion of all the proceeds for these degen games kind of just feeds into some public goods funding, would that make it less bad if the money's going in your pocket too? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I guess there's like the, you know, there's an opportunity to, to reward the, the things that we want to see in the ecosystem. So if you're building a public good, if you're building core infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem, then you can uh, then you can reward the people who are doing that. And I think that you know, like actually, I think the Protocol Guild is actually a really good. That's example what I, of this yeah. is like. Shout out to okay, Protocol Guild. So Protocol Guild, like if you're an uh, if you're an L1 developer, you can basically make like I don't know low six figures a year working for the Ethereum Foundation, or uh, or you can go start start an alt layer one, and Multicoin Capital will give you a bazillion dollars, and so. It's I've about done all those things. And, and what Protocol Guild does is they give you money for staying as an ETH core protocol developer, which allows you to sort of like live your values a, a little bit more. So I think that's a great example of, of some, a group that's doing that right. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, 8,000% APY is going to attract a good amount of liquidity. Yeah. But uh, that's not necessarily a good thing because it's not sustainable. Um, but I think the opportunity is going to keep bringing in money. It's more so people that try to start new protocols externally that are like very centralized. And I remember we, we had a project that we turned down. It was, I think it was with a centralized exchange and they were trying to just stand up some token standard that they were going to index. And yeah, they BR were going to BRC 20s. Yeah, it was like a new BRC 20 standard. And they were in, they're like, oh, we'll index it on our own. Like, don't worry about it. And I think that's where it's like, okay, well, this doesn't really align with our values. Yeah, you could make 100 million off of that, but it's not going to make actual progress. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think I would, so first off, I think one of the things that's amazing about this technology is that you know, it relies on the economic incentives that you talked about. I mean, there were like 50 attempts to do digital money before Bitcoin, and it was the economic incentives that were introduced that ultimately made it work. And I think similarly, different people, you know, kind of to Kevin's point around like, you know, Ethereum lets you program your values. I mean, I think you can actually make the economic incentives consistent with a value system as you define it, which is a really cool and powerful thing about smart contract platforms. But I think there's like, you're, that, that's the level of your question, but I think there's also the level that I think some of us are referring to here. I mean, Kevin, when he was referring to Ponzi schemes, like there's also this, this industry where you can say you're doing that, but then, and then make, you know, raise dollars yourself and like the incentives outside mm -hmm. of the protocol are driving a lot of behaviors. Like the classic example is FTX, right? I mean, FTX and its collapse, its rise and fall did Incre irreparable, maybe not irreparable, but severe damage to the reputation of this space, right? And obviously that person was responding to incentives. Sam Bankman was responding to incentives according to his values, right? And I think there's an opportunity here where, I mean, crypto fixes this, right? This is my answer to everything, but no, seriously though, I mean, I think this is one of the opportunities that cryptocurrencies and blockchain present is like, when you can build systems around these things, you know, you can encode these values in a way that is immutable and, and very widely understandable by many people. This is kind of back to the transparency point. And I think that's, that's the piece that I think is the opportunity. I think it's just about how do we manage, how do we reconcile that and the vision and the, the optimistic vision that I just described there with the behavior of opportunists who come to the space to yeah. you know, participate in the industry. So on that note, do you think that maybe we did too good a job of incentive design considering we've attracted such large amounts of volume and liquidity and value to this ecosystem we've created? I mean, I think it's incredible that the end, I mean, if you, even five years ago when I've started coming to ETH Denver, the amount of, the, of people who are here to kind of participate in this 
you know, in these conversations and learn more about cryptocurrency, get deeper in the space. It's amazing. That's a huge success. And no doubt, some people are in part or in whole driven by economic incentives. I mean, we all are affected by that in some, in some way, shape, or form. But I think it's just making sure that the balance, there's a balance between being motivated by that upside and that being aligned with the values that you're actually, that are consistent with what you're saying and that dominating your actions, right? I think that's really where I think it starts to blur the line. And the consequence of that is that people perceive the space as, oh, there's a couple, there's like one or two people doing interesting, cool, idealistic things, and then a bunch of grifters. Like that's, that's I think, a brand that we want to avoid. Yeah, I think, well, Kevin, you got anything to add? Uh, I was going to say, you know, what it makes me think of is good arts law, which is basically when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So you can program your values and your money and, uh, you know, people will find a way to exploit that measure in order to, I don't know, short, 100x long your, your love for public goods or something like that. And yeah. so uh, that makes me think that it's going to be an infinite evolutionary game uh, a dance between measures and targets until we, we figure it out. And you know maybe every market cycle, we, we sort of advance that forward. Yeah, so to take it back a, like a step, uh, do we think about like taking VC money is kind of incongruent to these values that we've claimed? I mean, it's a kind of seems what you guys are saying when you're talking about like multi-coin like coin and all those guys. Like, do you think v VC money kind of like poisons the well? I think that uh, anytime you give someone governance power over your project, it can alter the trajectory. And the best investors I know, I, I'm, Gitcoin was invested in by consensus and by paradigm, and they've always supported my vision and my direction for the project. And so I don't have a personal experience with, uh, you know, with, with that, but I, I think that in general, it's something that you as a founder, before you take that term sheet, should look uh, you should do reference checks on those investors and see if they're going to support your vision or if they're going to, you know, what happens when you give up that board majority or that governance control. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think can a uh, reasonable vesting schedule kind of solve a lot of the issues you have with VCs just turbo dumping their investment? It's not just VCs. I guess it's just like project insiders as well. I mean, yeah. all these projects are kind of susceptible to that like turbo dump. And, yeah. But vesting schedule, schedules kind of present something of like uh, maybe perverse incentives as well. I mean, we had talked about like the idea of a fair fair exit. Yeah, like a fair. There's fair launches. So what's a yeah. fair exit? What does that look like? Yeah. Because the founders and the people that are working on the project need to get their payday too, right? I guess the fairest way to do an or a fair exit should be the longer vesting schedule with smaller. Uh, token emission, because the larger and shorter the emission is, the more likely you're going to harm people that are involved. It's just going to like go to zero quicker. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like a fair exit would be something like that. I feel like the fair launch, like the whole concept of the fair launch, was kind of like the response to like VCs inundating the space. But fair launches weren't really necessarily fair for like the project founders and like the DAO and the community. So like, what did we learn from that and how do we solve that moving forward? Like, what's the solution to all these problems that we're just kind of talking about right now? On the topic of fair launches, how many people in this room remember Grin? It's a history, okay, yeah. Oh yeah. So Grin was like, yep. and this is five years old now. That was like Gitcoin tried to do some stuff with that too. Grin was, Grin, I Mimble mean. Mimblewimble. Yeah, exactly. So it was an implementation of Mimblewimble. Um, and they famously did a fair launch, which went yeah, spectacularly exactly. horribly. Yeah, it went <laughs> like, horribly because they didn't get paid. They had at all, no so money. There's no incentive the to keep couldn't stick around. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's tough. Look, all the and and by the way, I think if, if, so. You can point at Grin, but you can point at other protocols that have done a fair launch Based. and done fine, right? But I think you know it, these are very context. These are very contextual. You know, it's very context dependent. Um, there's no right answer. I think all these things come with trade-offs. Being Having a strong value system, and define, depending on how you define that, depending on how strongly and tightly you hold on to that, comes with trade-offs, right? Or not, right? Um, but I think, nonetheless, I do think it's important for us as an industry to have more conversations like this about what are the values that define us? Like, who is in my camp? Who is in our camp, right? And I think, like, on the one hand, you want to balance being inclusive and allowing people to come in and not discriminating against anyone with potentially different value systems with this 
with still a notion of, hey, what makes this special? Why is blockchain special? Why is this group special, right? And I think this is a, this is a struggle that most communities face, right? How do you be inclusive and exclusive at the same time? <laughs> um, but I, and I think cryptocurrency and blockchain industry and each individual company within it is no different. So, Kevin, you have a pretty big project. Like, uh, how's Gitcoin addressing any of these issues that we're discussing? You got great hair too. Yeah, perfect hair. Nice, nice uh, bull market hair. I bull think that's a that's a top signal, boys. <laughs> oh boy. Um, so. Uh, yeah, uh, Gitcoin 2.0 just launched, and we are allowing you to fund the things in your ecosystem that contribute to your ecosystem's public goods through Gitcoin grants. And uh, we've got like a bunch of tools that allow you to incentivize the builders in your ecosystem that are contributing to your to your public goods. And uh, public goods are good, so it's been a lot of fun to relaunch Gitcoin 2.0. So you and I worked on an EIP yeah. together. Is Gitcoin going to be picking that up, you think? You think we're going to be bringing that to the finish line together? Or? What's the EIP number oh, again? Oh, it's EIP 6968, technically, uh, but in EIP spirit it's 6969, and we all know why. Because that's the protocol number that gives as well as receives. <laughs> You know what we should have done is those guys who launched ERC 404, and they just ignored the yeah, protocol yeah, yeah, editors. Yeah, yeah, we should have just done it. We tried. Yeah. But uh, A.B. Cothup, that's the guy who's the narc. Well, you know, he, he, he was the one who re uh, rejected our pull request as uh, 6969. And the whole time we could have just ignored... He accused us of sniping. Why would we do that? We could have just ignored the process and just memed it. We but that would be values aligned, so we wouldn't do that. Well, I think that we caused a little bit of an uproar it's, within the EF and the core development community. Tempting, because they though. said, hey, this uh, EIP numbering is a relatively arbitrary. People want to take those meme numbers, too, so... Yeah. But I digress. Yeah, we're, we're tangenting. OK, so EIP 6969 was an EIP that Zach and I worked on. Uh, and the idea was contract secured revenue. Basically, this is an idea that if you have an L2 and you are a smart contract developer on your L2, then you'd receive a portion of the gas fees that were uh, consumed during the execution time on that L2. Which would otherwise be burned in the same fashion as EIP 1559. Yeah, so the idea was fund public goods in a way that's very governance minimized and elegant uh, in attracting developers to your protocol. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Zach and I submitted that EIP and uh, hopefully we'll have an L2 that is implementing it at some point in the future. I think a lot of L2s are implementing it, but in their own way. Uh, there's no like one standard necessarily. They are referencing the EIP that we wrote though. So that's kind of cool. I know that Mantle is working yeah. on some stuff. Optimism wanted to do that on the application layer. Uh, so I think I think it's gonna get some traction. It, and this is one of the things that I sort of feel um, very strongly about is that it really makes the, the, one of the things that I think is the biggest sin of of Web two is this like virtue signaling where it's like I can it's like talk is cheap I can go out and talk about what my values are and look at how virtuous I am because I made this Twitter post about how I'm standing with whoever. But um, one of the things about Web3 that I think is really incredible is that we can have cryptographic proof of virtue. And one of the ways to do that is to actually fund the things that are values aligned with, with you. And so I'm always looking for opportunities to align you know, what we say that we value with actual flows of funding. And EIP 6969 is a great way to do that because it's so governance minimized. Um, giving your money to Protocol Guild or Gitcoin in order to incentivize ecosystem development is a good way to do that. And um, you know, I think we're learning from launches like Mimblewimble that were like, you know, very purist, but didn't do the practical things around funding their builders yeah. that, that they need to be effective. Yeah, we were, we were too much, we were, we were too uh, like cypherpunk about it. We were too crypto anarchist. And then by the time it came to, you know, pay rent, I don't think it was uh, necessarily in our, in our favor. <laughs> yeah, so if you, you know, if you have the most purest launch ever and no one ever finds out about it, it doesn't really affect anything. So what we should be doing is trying to align what's ethical with what's legal with what's effective. And that's the way that you actually have make a dent on the universe. And um, one of the ways I'm focused on doing that is just getting more funding flows into open source software development, tooling, other public goods. Do you think Gitcoin would fund some sort of 6969 SDK that would allow NEL2 to implement that on the application layer? Because one thing I want to note is that uh, most L2s, pretty much every L2 that I'm aware of, uh, doesn't actually burn the fees that are accrued. Uh, they just collect them as sequencer fees and kind of put that to a DAO 
or some sort of centralized foundation, yeah. which then gatekeeps how those funds are distributed, we should probably minimize that. Yeah, I mean, I think, and also this is another problem is with capital allocation. Once you have a multi-billion dollar treasury, how the F do you distribute that in a way that incentivizes your ecosystem yeah. without, like, that's a big capital allocation decision. How do we get away from everyone just PVPing over a treasury? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this happened famously with uh, maybe not this exact event or its situation, but I think controversies around treasuries now they're used as Tezos. I mean, the project oh, yeah. is still around. Uh, Tezos is controversial for having a market cap of a token that's less than its treasury. Yeah, and they did balance, a massive right? ICO. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think in many ways, I personally view it as a bad thing, but I guess if you're optimizing for value at a foundation, it's a good thing. Um, and I think the other point I wanted to make quickly is, and this is based on you know the conversation we're having about Grin, two purists. I think it's the other important thing to note is like values are important, but also growth is important. I think the title of this panel is how do we grow while you know maintaining our values. But I think both are important. Like if you have values that no one else subscribes to or you don't have a microphone big enough for no one else to hear you, they're I don't want to say they're irrelevant, they're important to you, but they just may not be that impactful in the world, right? And so I think we have to be mindful of that. And I think you know, for better or worse, many of the biggest projects uh, speak with the loudest microphones and and their values kind of become the space's values in many ways. I think Ethereum was that. And I know, by the way, I agree with most of the Ethereum values. But nonetheless, I think it's just important to note that to have an impact broadly, you need to achieve also achieve scale. What's the size of your treasury? Uh, well, I haven't launched yet, so I, I guess zero dollars. All right. Well, cool. <laughs> Not big enough? I thought that would be a gotcha, but all right. <laughs> We're going to have to start PVP in that treasury. Yeah, let's go. Can we PVP over your treasury in like a year? So, the other thing, I feel like the biggest growth checkpoint recently is the ETFs. Like you have the Bitcoin ETF, there's Ethereum ETFs coming up. So are those values aligned? I don't know. I'm not a traditional finance guy. You look like one. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think... Don't let the golf attire <laughs> fool you. <laughs> that, that feels like the most recent growth checkpoint. Um, so I don't know. Okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, I think we're at time. Um, any questions from the audience? Let's go. Don't I think the ETFs are net extractive? Yeah. I think, <laughs> well, I guess I think it depends on from whose perspective. I guess if you're theoretically a Bitcoin holder, you could view this as net good because, you know, there's demand coming in for Bitcoin, which is driving up the price, which is making it appear to be more Yeah, we're almost at all-time highs case. right now. You know, so maybe you view it like, oh, okay, well, this is, this is uh, reinforcing the image that I have of this thing as an inflation hedge, potentially, if that's how you view it. So I think it could be viewed as good, but I think it could also be could be viewed as bad. Well, I mean, what if it's also a good entry point for like normies to kind of get exposure to what we're working on? And they're like, hey, look, yeah, there's like alternatives to this financial system that we've been so in like that's been so enshrined in everything we do. But then. Their holdings are like custodied, and they're just numbers on a screen. Yeah, custodied and stuff is not good, against, but an ETF yeah. is backed by the U.S. dollar, so yeah. it's kind of it's kind of good, I guess. You I like know. the dollar? I mean, I don't necessarily like it, but <laughs> it's backed by the military power of the United States, so I mean, that's pretty massive. It's scary. And the U.S. is probably one of the biggest holders of Bitcoin in the world. And uh, Kingfish over there. What's up, boy? Stand up. Give him the mic. Give him the mic. Let's go. Bumble clot. All right. So I have a question. We're going to pretend none of you are actually you, and you're your doppelganger who doesn't hold your values. So the road to hell is paved with good intentions and small steps. Let's talk about those small steps when you give up your values, and one thing leads to another, and you end up in a place where you're totally out of integrity. What do those small steps look like and what should people avoid in those small temptations in the road to hell and VCs and all that stuff, you know what I mean? Kevin? <laughs> Kevin, what are those small steps on the road to hell? 
It was a simple question. <laughs> Look, I have a, so uh, my perspective comes, so I was an investor before I was at A16Z, so I've written term sheets, oh, and wow. I've also received term sheets. Andy was a Green Beret. Look at those uh, muscles. Yeah, you said that, you know, yeah, <laughs> former. Uh, but anyway, no, I think, Look, I think it comes down to commitments that you make along the way that you feel like you have to fulfill. And then you make enough of those commitments and they start to conflict with each other. And that's why I think it's incredibly important that when you make commitments, and that, that could be in the form of accepting a term sheet, accepting money from a partner, uh, going out and making promises to your community. I think it's just incredibly important that as a leader, as a founder, as, a, as someone speaking for a project or a system of values, you very consciously consider what you're saying and when you say it. because. That's exactly, I think, how you end up in that way. You like, you're trying to do the right thing by someone at all times, and then at the end, in the final analysis, you've, you've, you're in hell. <laughs> in my opinion, that's how you get there. Uh, Pat, you have anything to say about going to hell? I haven't been there yet. Uh, but no, I think the one phrase we hear is like, oh, we'll decentralize it later. That's the classic. Oh, yeah, decentralize it later. Yeah, so let's we're take these take funds this first. money, and then we'll figure out how to make it <laughs> ethically valid. Yeah, right. That's the classic thing that you see over and over yeah. again. So I think just avoiding saying that, that's a red flag. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other, does that answer your question? No? No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, you're good. All right. Any other questions? We got any other questions in the audience? No? All right. Cool, you guys want to take like 15 seconds to shill yourself? Shill your things? Come on, shill. Shill, shill, shill. This is a shill, well, it's the, like a safe space. In the context of values and shilling, I'll try and combine these two things. So I work on a privacy protocol, and look, I think one thing that I think is lacking in the space currently is enough concern about privacy. I think, you know, when it comes to signaling our support for certain values or certain causes, sometimes you may not want to publicly associate yourself with these. I mean, famously Vitalik, this was a point he made about Tornado Cash, where he was like, hey, I want to support Ukraine, and I'm using Tornado Cash, and I think it's pretty obvious why he would want to use that, because you know he's a person with enough net worth and a big enough influence, you know, has a big enough personality that he could be a target of potentially a nation state actor that doesn't share his values. And I think you know we got to understand that there are people out there who are taking risks to signal their values or to contribute to causes they believe in, and I think Privacy preserving technology is essential to ensuring that they can that they can do that. Yeah, so uh, with Number Group, um, I think Zach and I are looking to work with partners and founders that do care about the values of decentralization. Um, on any given project, I feel like we invest some combination of capital, development, design, bad ideas, whatever it is. Um, and we want to work on projects that have high impact and actually grow the space while maintaining those values. So if you have something cool you're working on, you can shill it to us too. We'll be here. So. All right, so um, I've been get, working on Gitcoin for seven years. On Friday, we we're going to launch our first white paper ever. So excited to uh, set a course for how we can help people fund their public goods. And uh, so that launches on Friday. And then on Thursday, we are, uh, myself and Jeff Emmett and Jessica Zartler are uh, launching a book on MycoFi, which is uh, a book about what Web3 has to learn from mycelium and mushrooms. Mycelium and mushrooms, I know you're laughing. It's not because of the psychedelics, it's because they're the oldest peer-to-peer -peer network on planet Earth. And uh, there's a lot that we can learn about peer-to-peer -peer networks from mycelium. So. Uh, uh, on Thursday, we're launching the, the Mycelium Finance book, and on Friday, we're launching the Gitcoin 2.0 white paper, so where check it out we, on Twitter. Where can we go to find that? Follow me on Twitter. Oh, yeah, what's your Twitter? I'm uh, Owaki. Okay, there yeah. you go, O-W-O-C-K-I. Are you guys writing this down? I don't see anyone with their notepads. Yes, thanks. All right, I got you, um, boy. But this has been a lot of fun, Zach. Thanks for uh, co-hosting. Thank you. Clap. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah.